Chapter 18 of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter 18. An excellent way to get a fairy, and when you have her, bind her. Ancient Alchemist's Recipe. In the darkness, time crept along like a crippled thing slow-moving, hideous. Outside fell the monotonous drip, drip from trees and bushes, likened by Phillida to a horrid clock. The fog was a sounding board for furtive noises that grew up like fungi in the moist atmosphere. The thought of Phillida and Vere down in the pleasant living room tempted me almost beyond resistance. I wanted to spring up, to rush out of the room, to fling myself into my car and drive full speed until strength failed and gasoline gave out. Was that the lake which stirred in the windless night? The lake under which lay the fire-blackened ruins of the house where the first Desire Mitchell flung open an awful door that her vengeance might stride through? Was it too late for my desire to come, and time for the coming of that other? The step of Vere sounded on the gravel path where he walked beneath the window. He was making a trip of inspection, and would find no light shining from the room. I was about to rise and call down a word of reassurance to him, when a current of spiced air passed by me. I sat arrested in hope and expectancy. "'Here, after my warning? After last night?' her soft voice panted across the dark. "'Will you die, then? Cruel to me, and wicked to come here again. Oh, must I wish you were a coward!' Every vestige of her calmness gone, she was sobbing as she spoke. I could imagine she was wringing the little hands that once had left a betraying print upon my table's surface. I was cruel to you last night, Desire, yet afterward you saved my life by sending Ethan Vere to wake me. Would you have had me leave without meeting you again, neither thanking you nor asking your forgiveness? I thought she came nearer. For so little you would brave the dread one in its time of triumph? Oh, steadfast soldier! who faces the breach even in the hour of death, in all that you have done you have remembered me. Why speak of anger or forgiveness? Have I not injured you? Never. I love you. Is not that an injury? Even though I hid my ill-omened face from you, reared as I was to sad knowledge of the wrath upon me, the wrong has been done. Weak as water in the test, I kept the letter of my promise and broke the intent. Yet go, keep life at least. Desire, I do not understand you, I answered. No matter for that now. I am content to share whatever you bring. Not roughly or in challenge as I asked you last night, but earnestly and with humility I ask you to come away with me now. If trouble comes to my wife and me, I do not doubt we can bear it. Let us not be frightened from the attempt. Come. I, to take happiness like that? She marveled in desolate amazement. No, at least I will go to my own place, if tardily. Roger, be kind to me. Give me a last gift. Let me know that somewhere you are living. Out of my sight, out of my knowledge, but living in the same world with me. Each moment you stay here is a risk. In that warning she had reason. I rose. It was time to act, but action must be certain. If my groping movements missed her in the dark, there might be no second chance. Desire, if all is as you say, and we are not to meet again as we have done, you shall let me touch you before I go, I said firmly. 
No. Yes. Why, would you have me live all the years to come in doubt whether you were a woman or a dream? Perhaps you might seem at last a phantom of my own sick brain to which faithfulness would be folly? Here, across the table, I stretch my arm. Lay your palm in my palm. I may die tonight. Whether she wished it also, or whether my resolve drew obedience, I do not know. But a vague figure moved through the dark toward me. A hand settled in mine with the brushing touch of an alighting bird. I closed my hand hotly upon that one. I sprang a step aside from the table between us, found her, and drew her to me. What did I hold in my arms? Softness, fragrance, draperies beneath which beat life and warmth. As I stooped to reassure her, her breath curled against my cheek. So, with that guide, I turned my head and set my lips on the lips I had never seen. Did something uprear itself out there in the black fog? A cold air rushed across the summer heat of the fog, air foul as if issued from the open door of a vault. As once before, a tremor quivered through the house. The hanging chains of the lamps swung with a faint tinkling sound. I snatched Desire Mitchell off her feet and sprang for the door. Somehow I found and opened it at the first essay. We were out into the hall. With one hand I dragged the door shut behind us, then carried her on to the head of the stairs. There I set her down, but stood before her as a bar against any attempt at escape. A lamp shed a subdued light above us. I looked at my captive. Never again after that kiss could she deny her womanhood or pose as a phantom. So far my victory was complete. The lady might be angry, but it must be woman's anger. I knew she had not suspected my intention until I lifted her in my arms. She had struggled then, after her defenses had fallen. She was quiet now, as though the light had quelled her resistance. She stood drooped and trembling. Not the old-time witch, not the dazzling adventuress, only a small, fragile girl wound and wrapped in some gray stuff that even covered the brightness of her hair. Her face was held down and showed no more color than a water lily. I thought, she whispered just audibly, I thought you would say goodbye. I know, I stammered, but I could not. That way was impossible for us. She did not contradict me. She was so very small, I saw, that her head would reach no higher than where the bright spot had rested above my heart when I had last stood at the barrier. One hand gripped the veils beneath her chin and seemed the clenched fist of a child. The crash of my door had startled the household. I had heard Phillida cry out and Veer's running steps upon the gravel path. Now he came springing up the stairs. At the head of the flight he stopped, staring at us. Desire, I spoke as naturally as I could manage. This is Mr. Veer. Veer, my fiance, Miss Mitchell. Shall we go down to Phillida? And Desire Mitchell did not deny my claim. I am not very sure of how we found ourselves downstairs, nor do I remember in what words we made the two girls known to one another. Presently we were all in the living room, and Phillida had possession of Desire Mitchell, while Vere and I looked on stupidly at the proceedings. Phil had placed her in a chair beside a tall floor lamp and gently drew off the draperies that hooded her. With little murmurs of compassion, she unbound and shook free her guest's hair. "'My dear, you are all damp. This awful fog. 
You must have been out a long time. You shall drink some tea before we start. Drawls, will you light the alcohol lamp on the tea table? The kettle is filled. Now I could understand how desire had appeared amid a drift of fire-shot smoke in the beam of my electric torch the night before. Her hair was a garment of flame-bright silk flowing around her, curling and eddying in rich abundance. Over this she had worn the gray veils to smother all that color and sheen into neutral sameness with night and shadows. No wonder her face had seemed wraith-like when her startled shrinking away from the light had set all that drapery billowing about her. She was the voice that had been my intimate comrade through weeks of strange adventure. She was the woman of the faded yellow book and the painted beauty at the Metropolitan. She was all the desires of whom I had ever dreamed, and she was none of them, for she was herself. Her long, dark eyes, suddenly lifted to me, were individual by that ancestral blending of drowsiness and watchfulness, yet were akin to the eyes of youth in all times by their innocence. Her mouth, too, was the soft mouth of a young girl kept apart from sordid life. But her forehead, the noble breadth between the black tracery of her eyebrows, expressed the student whose weird, lofty knowledge had so often abashed my ignorance. Only my ignorance? Now, as she looked at me across the room, all self-confidence trickled away from me. What distinguished me from a thousand men she might meet on any city street? What had I ever said worth note in the hours we had spent together? Now she saw me in the light, plainly commonplace, and, remembering myself lame, I stood amazed at the audacity with which I had laid claim to her. She was rising from the chair, gently putting aside Phillida's detaining hands. She had not spoken one word since her faltered speech to me upstairs. Neither Vere nor Phillida had heard her voice. She had given her hand to each of them and submitted to Phil's care with a docility I failed to recognize in my companion of the dark. Her decisive movement now was more like the desire Mitchell I knew. Only, what was she about to do? Repudiate my violence and me? perhaps go back to her hiding place? She came straight to where I stood, not daring even to advance toward her. We might have been alone in the room. I rather think we were, to her preoccupation. You must go away, she said. If there is any hope, it is in that. Nothing else matters now, nothing. If you wish, take me with you. It would be wiser to leave me, but nothing really matters except that you should not stay here. I will obey you in everything if you will only go. Take your car and drive. Drive fast. Anywhere. It is impossible to convey the desperate urgency and fervor of her low voice. Phillida uttered an exclamation of fear. Vere wheeled about and left the room. The front door closed behind him. The gravel crunched under his tread on the path to the garage, and the rate at which the light he carried moved through the fog showed that he was running. He obviously accepted the warning exactly as it was given. After the briefest indecision, Phillida hurried out into the hall. For my part, I did nothing worth recording. I had made discovery of two places where I was not the lame feller, and if the first place was the dreary frontier, the second country was that rich land of promise in Desire Mitchell's eyes. What we said in our brief moment of solitude is not part of this account. Phillida was back promptly, her arms full of garments. With little murmurs of explanation by way of accompaniment, she proceeded to invest desire in a motor coat and a dark blue velvet hat, rather like an artist's tam-o'-shanter. 
I noticed then that the girl wore a plain frock of gray stuff, long of sleeve and skirt, fastened at the base of her throat with severe intent to cover from sight all loveliness of tint and contour. Nothing farther from the fashion of the day or the figure of my cousin could be imagined. "'You must wear the coat, because it is always cool motoring at night,' Phillida was murmuring. "'And of course you will want it at a hotel, unless you can do some shopping. I will just tie back your gorgeous, scrumptious hair with this ribbon, now. I know I haven't enough hairpins to put it up without wasting an awful lot of time, but we will buy them in the morning.' We are going to take the very best care of you every minute, so you must not worry. You are so kind to me, Desire began tremulously. No one was ever so kind. It does not matter about me, or what people think of me, if he will only go away from here quickly. Right away, Phillida soothed. My husband has gone for the car. I hear him coming now. In fact, Vere was coming up the veranda steps. His hand was on the knob of the outer door, fumbling with it in a manner not usual to him. Then the knob yielded and he was inside. "'But how slow you are, Drawls!' his wife called, with an accent of wonder. Vere crossed the threshold of the room, his gaze seeking mine. He was pale, and drops of fog moisture pearled his dark face like sweat. "'I am sorry, Mr. Locke,' he addressed me, ignoring the others. "'Perhaps you felt that shake-up a quarter hour ago? Like a kind of earthquake, or the kick from a big explosion a long ways off. It didn't seem very strong to me. It was too strong for that old tree by the garage, though.' Must have been decayed clear through inside. Willows are like that, tricky when they get old. "'Ethan, what are you talking about?' cried Phillida, aghast. He continued to look at me. "'I guess it must have fallen just about when you slammed your door upstairs. Seems I do remember a sort of second crash following the noise you made.' I was too keen on finding out what was happening up there to pay much heed. Well, Vere? Tree smashed down through the roof of the garage, he reluctantly gave his report. Everything under the hood of the automobile is wrecked. There is no motor left and no radiator. Just junk mixed up with broken wood and leaves and pieces of the stucco and tiles of the garage. So there was to be no going tonight from the house beside the lake. A frustrated group, we stood amid our preparations, the two girls wearing cloaks and hats for the drive that would never be taken. Had we ever really expected to go? Already the project was fading into the realm of fantastic ideas, futile as the pretended journeys of children who are kept in their nursery. Desire lifted her hands and took off the blue velvet cap with a resignation more expressive than words. Only my practical little cousin charged valiantly at all obstacles. "'We aren't ever going to give up?' she cried protest. "'Cousin Roger? Ethan? You cannot mean to give up. Why, phone to the nearest garage to send us another car.' If we pay them enough, they will drive anywhere. Or if they cannot take us to New York, they will take us to the railroad station where we can get a train for some place. Can't we, Drawls? We could, Vere admitted. I'd admire to try it anyhow. But the telephone wire came across the place right past the garage, you know. The tree tore the wire down, too? I'm afraid it snapped right in two, Phil. We, we might walk, she essayed. But even her brave voice trailed into silence as she glanced toward the black, dripping night beyond the windows. Or if we found a horse and wagon, she murmured a final suggestion. 
Vere shook his head. Come, I assume charge with a cheerfulness not quite sincere. None of us are ready for such desperate efforts to leave our cozy quarters here, especially as I fancy Vere's earthquake was the tremor of an approaching thunderstorm. I felt it myself. Let us light all the lamps and draw the curtains to shut out the fog which has got on everyone's nerves by its long continuance. We are overwrought beyond reason. Suppose we sit here together, strong in numbers, for the few hours until daylight. I think that should be safeguard enough. Tomorrow we will do all we had planned for tonight. Come in, Vere, and close the door. He obeyed me at once. Desire Mitchell passively suffered me to unfasten and take off the coat she wore, too heavy for such a night. She had uttered no word since Vere announced the destruction of the car. She did not speak now, when I put her in the low chair beneath the lamp. I had a greed of light for her, as a protection and because darkness had held her so long. "'It seems as if we should do something,' Phillida yielded unwillingly. Vere's eyes met mine as he turned from drawing the last curtain. We were both thinking of the force that had driven the frail old willow tree through tile and cement of the new building to flatten the metal of motor and car into uselessness. The mere weight of the tree would not have carried it through the roof. To do something by way of physical escape from that. The ribbon had glided from Desire's hair, almost as if the vital resilient mass resentfully freed itself from restraint by the bit of satin. Now she put up her hands with a slow movement and drew two broad strands of the glittering tresses across her shoulders, veiling her face. Wait, she answered Phillida most unexpectedly. I must be sure, quite sure. I must think. If you will wait... End of chapter 18 Recording by Roger Moline